Helen Kapalos, welcome to Roll With The Punches. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great Tell to you be what, here. we've rolled with them this morning, haven't we? <laughs> yes, we had just a couple of little gremlins in the system. Neither, little, neither, of us, <laughs> neither of us are raising our hand for an IT award this year, are we? <laughs> no, definitely not. I am definitely, yeah. I don't know what was worse. You couldn't get your sound working. I think what's worse than that, what's more embarrassing than that, was how hilarious I thought my jokes were every time realising afterwards that you couldn't hear them. <laughs> when you're on Zoom and someone can't hear, we did it. Actually, I remember a live podcast that Harps did once. This is a live podcast. And a few people were giving feedback. It was done online, so a whole bunch of There was like 60 or 70 people in there watching. And... <laughs> Oh and at God. some point, a couple of people were commenting in that they weren't getting any sound. And so we paused for a second. We're workshopping it and we're telling them, we're t- like, we're telling them with our voices what to do to make the sound work. And it was about five minutes and we're like, oh, hang on. You can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though. And that's exactly what I was doing for the last half an hour. I was like, Blah, 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 blah. And then I would start singing and I'm like, oh, God, I really hope the sound doesn't work while I'm here having a bit of a sing-along. I like that. I like that. <laughs> anyway, happy Monday. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. I think, yes, look, if we could frame this, you know, like if we've gotten through this this morning and we're calm and happy, then it should be the tempo for a good week. This is true. And I hope so. Look, I'm going to have a little brag. I've started something new. I've started something life-changing and new the last couple of days. I'm halfway through a four-day course of it. And I think that things like this that are like, I'm just feeling like everything in my life right now is water off a duck's back. Nothing's phasing me. I'm doing a transcendental meditation course. Oh, are you? How awesome. Have you heard of that? I have, yes. I, I, I have done a course like that, but quite a while ago um but i'm reading joe Dispenza's book again at the oh, moment how good um, is and that just really yeah and actually my partner he kind of uh, borrowed it and said oh, i want to read it as well and um and so we've he's been you know we've been like going right um sharing the meditations and just reminding ourselves that you know that reset is only five or ten minutes away if you just you know it's so weird that we try and distract ourselves from actually being peaceful and calm and all the things we want to be um, and then we know that we have to be to function really well but it's bizarre like the relationship to resistance with that is so weird isn't it because you know you've got to do it but you no I don't want to do it. I want to stay in the pain a bit longer or you know what if I'm really successful what if that you know that also is really you know can, it's all those things that you yeah. just kind of grapple with it's bizarre it is bizarre and that's exactly, I, you know, I think everything in life we get to a tipping point and yeah. where it's like do or die. And that was where like this was my, because this is an expensive course for four days, especially when you're someone who never, ever, like I've every, it's been on my list. I need to meditate. I know I need to meditate. I know that it's something that I really benefit from and it'll bring a lot of good things into my life and there's a million reasons why I should do it. And I never do it, and it's free, and all you have to, all you need is discipline and commitment. And as a, as a former athlete, that you know, I have, I've proven that I have that. I have the ability to have discipline and commitment, but I'm not doing it. And then I was like, "Whoa, are you really going to drop twelve hundred bucks on this four day course for something <laughs> that you've proven to yourself for the last thirty eight years that you're not really, you know, <laughs> you're not prioritized? Like you could just do it for free. You could just do it." Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, the science around, you know, I think what has make, is making me do it is this, A, I love the science around it. So we're getting deep on the science. So there's all of these yeah. reaffirming um, details. It's like, yes, I want that. Yes, I want that. And I walked to the course yesterday in home. And as I walked home, it was an hour's walk. And I just thought, this is, this is it. Like there is... Like if I don't, if I choose not to do this now with all of the stuff that I've just looked at and looked at the science around and I choose not to do this, I'm literally punching myself in the face. Yes. Like I have no right to ever complain. I will never complain that I'm burning out. I will never complain that I'm too busy. I will never complain that I'm, that I'm amped up and that I'm not getting enough calm in my life or I don't have time for creativity or I'm not tapping into it. It's like, 
because here's this one thing that can give you all that. It's if unbelievable. If you're choosing to not do it, you can't complain about it. Yeah, 100%. That's a really good way of looking at it, actually. Sometimes, yeah, we've got to sort of use the reverse psychology, I think, to get us in the frame of, you know, where we need to be, um, whatever it takes to get you there, I say. Um, but, yeah. yeah, it is bizarre. It's just essentially we're dealing with resistance. And I think, yeah, it's it's fascinating um, how big a role that plays in everyone's life because I was chatting to someone about this on the weekend and we were talking about, you know, um, how someone was saying oh you know you always move a lot you know you move jobs and you you know you're always sort of like fearless going from one thing to another and uh, just sort of commenting on different you know it was me and a friend so I was saying it to both of us going well, how come you guys always move around and do things and I'm like well it's really scary to do that actually but you know they're saying oh no we're stuck in this job we've got to do it and I'm like but we're never stuck in anything we're, like we we always have the personal freedom to change things and I find it interesting that how often you hear people, you know, convincing themselves that they cannot move away from where they are um, because they're all essentially just excuses because we all, like, of course it's disruptive and maybe there's a bit of pain, short-term pain involved and uncertainty, but I think once you move through that, um, you, like, the benefits are just so brilliant and beautiful really because you just don't, you know, like it's that saying, everything is on the other side of fear. Um, so, yeah, I find it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Humans. Oh, me too. And it's, I feel like it's always, there's always this dance between, and I love talking about it, the dance between where where is the line where I need to kick up the ass yes. and the line where I, I need self-compassion. And for everyone that's different, and, and so we need to stop looking to everyone else for the answer oh, hey, Helen, can you tell me exactly where that line is in my life that you know nothing about? It's like that's yeah. literally what we do. Yes. Like, excuse me, expert in something. Here I am. You know nothing about me. I want the answer. Tell me exactly where that line is. And you're like, they don't actually, no one lives inside your world, inside your way of thinking, your psychology, your history, your trauma, your your challenges, your everything. It's so true because we all have different wounds that we bring with us. Yeah. Always related to one of our parents normally. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mum and Dad. Those rat bags. They <laughs> ended up being human after all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that point when you realise, oh, hang on, they're human, you know, they're yeah. fallible, they're weak, they're, they're going to make mistakes, they've made mistakes. You know, I don't, you know, there is a point in your life when you, you cross that bridge and you think, oh, damn, you know, um, I've been looking up to them and, you know, modelling all of my behaviour um, on the values that have sort of been set before me, but realising that it's not a perfect mirror. Um, they actually don't hold the manual or the playbook for, you know, that perfect behaviour um, and they've got their own wounds to get over. So it's interesting yeah. when you can look at that objectively and go, okay, I know what's going on right now and, yep, I'm having a reaction or I'm in a reaction right now because of this and there's the trigger, okay, stop. Pull mm. yourself up, get out of it, move, you know, get away from it, get away from it, get away. <laughs> you know, it's like that. You're just talking yourself into, um, you know, yeah, moving past something that might be triggering and it might be triggering for a long time. I think for me, I always thought, you know, if I do the work, if I, you know, if I do this work, then it'll, I'll get over it and I'll never see it again. I'll never see that ugly wound pop up again. But that's not true. It pops up in different ways until we actually get it, absorb it and figure out how to detach from it. Uh, and until we do that, we can't really ever move through and get to that next level. Um, so, and it's okay if it takes a long time. It's okay. Like, it's just, again, um, you know, I think it's up to us. We, we, you're right, we hold the answer as well. We, we decide how far we want to move and to what stage and what that next stage might look like. And a lot of it's got to do with fear of, oh, no, I'm moving in the right direction. Sometimes we can be the worst saboteurs because we actually don't want to feel what it feels like to, to have, you know, things go right and um, to move into, a, um, I guess, a stream of success that feels like it might be diff difficult to uphold um, and to keep consistently there. Um, and, you know, I, I reflect on that as well with, you know, um, having had, a, you know, some of my career in the um, public eye and I think, you know, why don't I do more, you know, um, I guess externally facing, the, you know, why don't I do a bit more in my blog and, you know, because I think, well, it's just, you just feel vulnerable being out there all the time because you're also 
sort of someone else's commodity and sometimes mm-hmm. it's hard to know when not to take that feedback seriously or um, how to step away from it and realise that that isn't your total identity. So, it's, And I'm sure that you probably find the same thing. Um, it's it's really interesting. You're different personas yeah. um, that are oh, yeah. for different people. Yeah. I have a newfound appreciation, deep appreciation for journalists as of the last couple of weeks, by the way. So this will be interesting for you to hear. Oh, okay. I don't watch the news or any, like I don't watch TV and I steer clear of the news because I don't like to be reactive to things. So it's not something I watch or have much to do with. And I went to the Quill Awards a couple of weeks ago. I'm doing oh, yeah. a pod, yeah, I'm doing a podcast, helping produce a podcast for the Dart Centre of Journalism and Trauma, two things that are like the intersection of things that really um, intrigues me, you know, people that are out reporting on and invest, doing investigative journalism around crisis and disasters and trauma and conflict. And in the first, a couple of things I'll say, in the first five minutes there was some clips played of some really great journalism in Victoria and I leaned over to Erin. Erin took me there. She's um, with the organisation I went with and she suffers vicarious trauma from 15 years of researching the first responders that attended the 9-11. And through her compassion around that and her embedding herself into that research for 15 years, she now has vicarious trauma and suffers a lot of the symptoms and the emotions around that. And within five minutes of watching those clips, I leaned over to her and I said, it really, it, it does not surprise me in the least that you have these symptoms because the feeling in my physiology as I watch this five minute clip of and I hear the music and I hear the headlines and I see what's happening in the world the way it's presented but also the second thing was hearing some of the stories around the invest investigative investigative journalism see why I'm not a journalist Helen (laughs) and I speak very clearly (laughs) happens to everyone don't you worry (laughs) but um you know, some of the stories that were uncovered and then understanding that they just changed, these humans just changed history, right? So I put you guys in the kind of in the same category as when I speak to policemen. So I speak to a lot of first responders, but police have this persona where there's a bit of a, they have to have a bit of an armor on when they're out in the public because there's this like, oh, oh, the cops. And I think that journalism gets an unfair kind of crack at, oh, the media, you know, and people diss the media and and throw a lot of shit at the media but also the stuff that you know that is getting brought into the open that's creating change in the world that we live in for the better is quite commendable it's amazing and it was just something i'd never thought about before so rant over congratulations thank you for your work no no, thank you no it's well it's nice to actually hear someone um i guess portrayed in the way that you know, you experience it um, because it's it's a really tough profession. Um, I know, you know, some of the early mantras when I entered journalism where you're only as good as your last story and, you know, you think that that's just a throwaway line, but it's actually the truth because you are judged every day um, on what you produce and it's a really a fiercely competitive environment, but it's also an emotionally taxing job um, because you are dealing with raw emotions, you are dealing with things that, People should never have to see, experience, witness. You're in amongst the absolute human carnage at times and it can't not impact you. And, you know, there have been stories that I've worked on, you know, where I've just had nightmares for weeks on end um, and I've needed therapy or needed to talk to someone Mm -hmm. um, or I've been, you know, with a group of cameramen and reporters and we've all just, you know, ended up at the pub um, you know, and you can understand why alcohol plays a role at times as well. I know when I did the police rounds years ago in Sydney, you know, every Thursday night they'd all meet at the Shakespeare Hotel and, you know, it was just the done thing. It was, and a lot of the time that I did court reporting as well, um, you know, the lawyers, journos, um, cameramen, um, and often, you know, um, police as well were all part of an ambulance um, and, you know, um, all types of first responders, I guess, were part of those groups um, where we have to regularly, regularly debrief. And I guess that was before a time where it was recognised that PTSD might be a thing or that, you know, there might be different trauma reactions. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's really, it's really, really tough. Like this, some of the things that you see just, um, you know, uh, 
yeah, I just, it's, it's indescribable. You're seeing twisted, you know, bodies and flesh and babies killed and, you know, like just really horrific, horrific things. You're seeing people arrive at a scene, um, you know, realising that, you know, their relatives trapped in that car or, you know, in that fire or whatever it might be, um, or you're in the middle of an earthquake helping someone look for their relative that you know um who ends up being deceased and you're there capturing that reaction thinking I've got to pull away I can't show this you know because there's two parts of you grappling with that story going I know I'll be expected to capture this but also this you know um we have to be really decent about how we capture um about how we report things so there's always that thing where you're grappling with values as well, going, okay, I have to, you know, do the right thing um, by people. And um, maybe sometimes that means forfeiting, you know, being the first one with the pictures that, you know, um, are going to perhaps, you know, um, be considered, you know, better coverage. Um, and I've never regretted any of those choices because I just think we, you know, um, that must be just horrific for people to go through that. So, yeah, it's, and, and I've worked with people that have actually had PTSD and um, I worked with a girl um, for years. We did, you know, we covered a lot of Supreme Court trials and, and just even hearing all those stories, having to interview the families, having to interview victims um, for, because she ended up doing it a lot longer than, you know, most of us. We'd all, you know, do it maybe a couple of years, move on to the next thing, you know, maybe state parliament or whatever the next round was. But because she was there for over a 10-year period, she just, her PTSD was intolerable. She had to leave the profession. So, yeah. And at the time, I remember it not being considered seriously as though it was like a weak reaction. But I saw a lot of people. I saw when I was at SBS back in the early days, I remember... Um, uh, cameraman um, that had worked over um, and witnessed the Rwanda massacre never went back to work again. I remember one one crew never ever went back. So yeah, mm. it's um it's interesting and uh, yeah and like any profession, there's going to be people that do the right thing in those situ situations and people that maybe don't handle them as well um, because they you know they're more driven about um more driven by getting you know or capturing um you know that news first. Um, mm. But yeah, that was always something that I always thought like it was an ethical constraint but it was a good one um, to have because we're you know I'd always put myself in their shoes the other thing I always worried about was turning up somewhere and thinking what if I know that person what if I know the person in that car crash what if I know the person um you know that's been killed in that train crash or like what you know all of those different things so yeah, there's, there's a lot to it. And, yeah, it's interesting to, you know, to see that talked about as well because I think people just think about, oh, yeah, journos sometimes get killed, but they don't think that you're always witnessing things that are pretty horrific and over a long period of time as well. Yeah. And when you, like when you mentioned, you know, those ethical choices, it's uh, what also intrigues me is, well, well, two parts. One is 95% or whatever the number is, something around that, of our, of our thoughts are subconscious so we're meaning making machines. So there's all of this stuff that, that holds a meaning to us and thus creates a physiological response, a behavior and a reaction. Um, and then there's this 5% of our cognition that we're conscious of and, and that happens afterwards. So that's our, us laying down our story upon it. But it's also with, with journalists and first responders and all of the people that are going into traumatic events or into witness things like that, there's that, like I said, about that armour and that you're training your system. You know, like no one goes in with bad intentions. No one go. I don't believe even the ones that from the outside you might go, they've got no ethics. When they're in that moment with their conditioning and their armour and their thoughts and their behaviours and their history, nobody's going in going, don't care about the people just going to get, you know, like I don't think yeah. intentions are bad. I just think there are levels of and, and layers and layers of what makes us human and, and operate and think and make decisions. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to me. Yeah. And I just want to, I just want the, us, the, the people that are not in these, like I just, I know that when I first started, being interested in this, you know, with first responders at first, but in all of these areas of, you know, what's it like in the life of that career and how many people going into that career had much awareness of it um, 
and at what point did did you gain an awareness like when you went got into journalism was there any part of you that had an awareness on this will be confronting or do you kind of get into the job first and then go oh 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 i have to do oh i'm doing this well that's a really good question because no to answer your question i had no i don't know why i think for me it was all about you know um, we're unmasking or demystifying a topic or um, we're taking layers away so that we can bring the truth out. You know, it was, I sort of just always thought about it in that way. So I always thought it was, you know, this great adventure it would be yeah. an incredible adventure. And in some ways it is an adventure because you don't know what you're doing from day to day. So again, you're part of like that non-linear, the way we're living our lives, you know, um, even though we like to think everything's grouped and we can control things, um, you know, journalism is that crazy profession that mirrors life, you know, that um, where you don't quite know what, what's going to come out of where. Um, but for whatever reason, I just did not think about the fact that I might face trauma, uh, that I might see confronting things. I don't know why I never thought that. I just thought... I don't know, I thought about it at long form investigative style and I thought it'll, it'll be about documentary making and it'll be about, you know, really um, having a, um, a deep understanding of a topic and bringing that awareness to people. But never really did I consider that, of course, your, you know, journalism is capturing all parts of history in the making, um, which can also include, you know, tragic events, uh, which can end... You know, often um, because it is such an you know, it's such a, it's a, such a strong att attachment to adrenaline in this job as well. It's a really adrenaline based profession. Um, I think early on I was confounded by people that would actually get excited by some of the tragic things, like oh my gosh, we're going to. I remember uh, like in the first couple of years when I was a radio journal in Newcastle, um, this uh, young colleague said. Um, yay, we've got a triple fatal. And I'm like, what? Wow. And um, I could not believe what I was hearing. Um, and that, like, didn't happen just once either. I mean, you know, people get excited, like, we've got this huge event going on, there's five dead, there's, you know, like, let's go, 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 get everyone, get, you know, let's see what's going on. And you never really, like, people just didn't get, you know, generally get caught up in it. Oh, my gosh, it's so tragic. Like, you know, um, they just... It would be more about, okay, we've, you know, because you're just on that adrenaline, like, going, okay, we've got to get out there and we've got to find out what's happened. But I'd always find it really disturbing, you know, like a whole family is wiped out in accidents. And I just, you know, I'd think about it for days and days and days. And, um, and it would be really upsetting to me, even from the first minute that I was called on the job. So, you know, what will we see? What, you know, what, yeah. you know, how will we be the ones that have to tell the family? Are we the ones? Because often you're at a story and you've got family and people coming up to you as well. So you play or you meet someone in a long court trial, for example, where they've had a horrific murder and attachments form. So you get close to those families. They rely on you for information. Um, so there's that, those sorts of relationships as well that, you know, where there's hard to kind of form boundaries because you also want to be compassionate and, you know, provide some empathy and, and also strike the agreements with the family so that, you, you know, go back to the herd of journalists going, right, we're not, you know, we're not going to film this. We're going to, so try and find, you know, find a way that we can all agree um, to respectfully um, capture, you know, vision of them, but leave them, you know, where to leave them alone as well. So it's not yeah. so full on. I'm pretty sure that doesn't happen in Fleet Street or anywhere, but, um, <laughs> but I know it can definitely happen in Australia. Um, so I saw that happen quite a bit, which was good to see. Yeah, wow. What has it brought, like in terms of you personally, your, your life, that focus and like kind of jumping in the deep end of that sort of emotional exposure and thus uh, learning to cope with uh manipulate uh and recover and be safe and do you, how does you reckon that's enhanced your life enhanced your the way that you uh, or you know even just having an awareness on it it gives you a lot of gratitude actually yeah um that you're here every day that you can get up and do you know build something and you know so i think it's enhanced my awareness of absolutely how um I guess the random, the randomness of life and, um, and also how we just don't know. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know people's lives can be irrevocably turned upside down 
um, in moments. So I think it's given me always an appreciation for, you know, um, being really grateful for, you know, when things are right and things are, you know, the family's safe and, you know, um, and I often think about people that, you know, they don't have their sister or brother or they don't, you know, that type of thing or they've lost them in a really tragic way and how that might impact their life. So, um, yeah, I think it's definitely created an awareness within me, you know, to be extraordinarily grateful um, and not take things for granted and, yeah, understand that people, like, we do sit in the seat of privilege more than we think, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really interesting, just pulling yourself up on that at times. Like the other day, <laughs> I couldn't find a makeup artist <laughs> and I was just bitching about it all day. Um, and, you know, she, well, what happened was, my lady that I booked some makeup in with because I was hosting an event um, and she just forgot about it. And so she, you know, had like, you know, 45 minutes to sort it all out and I was just raging inside, you know, like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> and then I thought about it and thought, oh, God, pull yourself together, you know, like it was ridiculous. Um, yeah, she's forgotten her the appointment. Yes, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bit annoying because in some ways that makeup is your armour in front of people as well, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so I get it from that point of view. But then I just thought, like, it's just not a thing to hold on to. Like, it's, what a stupid grievance, you know. Like, what a silly thing to even be worried about. Mm. Um, you know, maybe it was meant to happen so I could just turn up looking a bit more natural and I think actually I felt a lot better about myself, which was weird. Um, but, yeah, because I convinced myself that I always need that, you know, um, to head out into the world so yeah. it actually gave me a gift um but I thought you know gosh how much do I like how privilege do I actually sit in if that sort of stuff riles me up you know um so it just made me it was just one of those moments of like okay you know stop and also stop thinking that everything's just got to you're in the flow we're in the flow everything's going really well you know like last night I did a really really hard yoga class and I in the you know at the beginning I was like I just don't know if I'm going to better do this like I'm, these downward dogs are you know they're just too, too <laughs> hectic um but uh then it reminded me of like when you go through and I and honestly I was thinking I'm so stiff I can't I can, literally can't do this and the more I you know then something amazing happened all these layers started sort of coming off and uh, I could move through it and I thought yeah like even yoga is just one of those amazing things that you get to do and I always have resistance to going to a class but the more I got through those really hard um, twists and turns and you know I felt really proud of myself because I just found some other new place in myself where I could get through that and it just reminded me of life like we always the tough times are really great teachers and when you get through them actually you're building something amazing and like even last week I had some you know thing with work and I was like I just can't do it you know I just started in this horrible self-talk narrative when I was like you know telling myself no nah, can't do it shut it down and then I thought no nah, sit with the discomfort sit with it and I started doing you know a few affirmations and bits and pieces but I just found what I needed to do like it just came to me and I thought yeah it's just like it just reminded me everything we need we have but we just you know we've got to find those like the strength always to just you know challenge ourselves to stretch it and you know move through and it's you know and I know that sounds really simple and maybe we've heard it before but it's always there um and we've never at the um, other side of the rainbow really like it you know life is about this it's what we have to do it's how we have to live um because um you know, I just think human, evol- human evolution, it's not about, oh, how to work really well within the system and how to nail that system. Actually, it's always the biggest um, challenge is how we work with ourselves and how, we, you know, we're, we're here to bring something into the world that no one else has brought into the world. We exist to do that, you know, and we all have that something that we're bringing in all the time. And I just think, you know, again, just being reminded of that, you know, um, and understanding that just go easy on yourself because yeah it is a bit uncomfortable and it is a bit painful and it's going to bring up stuff but you're going to feel so good once you get through those you know next couple of downward dogs and you know and um and you're doing them really well after 40 minutes and you're like well what who who is this oh wow you know so I don't know I just think it's you know those lessons are all all around us um and I remind myself of it a lot um not because I think oh gosh I'm so good at getting through challenges no I'm just like everyone else I can have really reactive and bad temperament and you know all that sort of stuff and but it's just about being aware enough having enough awareness I guess to be able to 
you know, pull yourself out of them in a methodical way, I guess, um, and understanding that you always have the capacity to do that. And maybe next time the reaction's not going to be as bad and it mightn't, be, mightn't take you as long or to figure it out. But, you know, um, we're always learning. If we don't remember that, then we're going to be in trouble. Yeah. You know, when you talked about the, the makeup story, it made me think of recently my, um, had, a, had a guest on Dr. Bill, who's now my therapist. Guest oh, wow. turned therapist. Awesome. Yep. So we did some <laughs> live therapy sessions and I was like, hey, bro, do you want to just be my therapist? Um, but in the <laughs> in our second podcast, we were talking about something and we ended up talking about triggers, emotional triggers. And it was at this point, I've, I've mentioned this before, sorry, listeners, but um, I went, ah, oh, when I was like 17 and I used to work and I used to drive home from work and as I drove home, I lived with mum and she would be at the kitchen bench dishing my dinner. And if she wasn't doing that, I would have this massive trigger. I would be so, so in my terms, such an asshole that I would just have to get, I would just, if, if dinner wasn't ready, I had to wait 15 minutes. There was this just massive shitty emotional reaction where I'd just get the hell out because I couldn't even be nice. It was like fine. And I'd go and I'd sit in my room seething with, and I was like, and Bill's like, so we uncovered this don't so I have this reaction to people who are late so lateness or a, you know because I think that there was this a, a little bit of abandonment but also he goes you've got a big yeah. a, a don't matter button so in those moments it was you don't matter and so it's when when I look at things like well it's not the makeup it's not the makeup maybe it's we all have a relationship with a sense of control or a sense of mattering or maybe a bit like there's always some deep thing. So now I look at situations and go, what is it about that that might be represented? Like what is that representing that's causing? Because it's not the lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the mascara. I can put that on. Maybe it is for you the the armour. Like I, you, I feel, you know, I know in the boxing ring at first I – there was a lot of emotional dissociation in my life. And so I didn't feel things in there. And then when I did three years of therapy, went back to fighting again and got in the ring, I felt exposed, vulnerable, seen, naked. I felt all of these things being in there that I didn't feel before because this layer of dissociation had come off and I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable. You know, it was really interesting to me. So rant over. Oh, I, um, love it. I love it. And actually, I've got to apologise. I was two or three minutes late as well. But <laughs> I was actually sitting here ready, excited, but I don't know what was going on. As you know, we had a big tech. But I have a bit of a reaction to the late thing um, as well at times because you think, oh, people aren't respecting me. And then there's that story that you're telling yourself, you know, um, and, yeah, it always comes from somewhere. But, yeah, it's interesting, like, you know, that you had that reaction going back into the ring um, because, yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I feel like that any time I'm, I'm seeing something or, you know, like a, what are they expecting? And I think part of that armour story was, oh, no, what if I don't look like the person they remember seeing or, you know, like what, what does that mean then? You know, mm -hmm. I was just, you know, and it's like, oh, just cut yourself a break, you know. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm forever fascinated. Before we run out of time for it, tell me a bit about your latest, um, I was going to say obsession, or your latest area of interest. Oh, obsession, yeah. It is a, a bit of an obsession. Um, it's a re-obsession um, because um, six years ago I did this documentary on medicinal cannabis and um, it was as I was leaving the TV world um, and I mortgaged my place because I thought it would start off as a seven minute feature and then it ended up being 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And um, I kept employing, um, you know, different people and money was running out and whatnot. Wow. Um, so um, I, I can only describe it as a, um, you know, as a definitely an obsession. Probably I think it was a healthy obsession. That's what I'm going to categorize it as. Um, and anyway, so I ended up doing this documentary. I traveled to Israel and um, around Australia um, and one of the reasons I wanted to fund it myself is that I wanted to be able to 100% own all of it um, and have no one um, coming in and giving that editorial um, mm -hmm. interference because I'd experienced that so much through my career. So anyway, I did this documentary. It was released in 2016 and um, it's actually in the last two weeks just come out on Binge. It's been re-released. Mm. Um, and essentially what it is um, is 
I guess a story of, you know, um, when medicinal cannabis was first being debated in Australia at that time, um, I met a really beautiful young man. He was in his 20s and he was um, grappling with bowel cancer, but he was using it not just to relieve his um, pain symptoms, but actually treating the cancer. So I'd unearthed all of this stuff. I found out people were using it for epilepsy with young children with intractable epilepsy and different conditions. And I thought, well, this is amazing. So when I did the research, I noticed there was a lot going on in Israel. They did a lot of human trials. Um, and anyway, um, so after, so I did the documentary. Um, and then after the documentary, I went into a different role in, um, around multiculturalism in Victoria. And then now, since that's finished, um, I've returned back to uh, the medicinal cannabis world because the industry itself is in a much different place. So in the last couple, like even in the last year, prescriptions around Australia have doubled. Um, so now we're seeing quite a um, an industry that's still in its infancy, but it's actually at that tipping point that you mentioned earlier. So yeah. it's a really interesting time to be back in that world. So I've joined a, a company um, as the head of comms and community outreach. Um, where I'm helping them establish a foundation so that people can get compassionate access to. And actually one of our um, priority cohorts is um, veterans with PTSD and also first responders. Um, wow. to for the, because in Israel, that was a federally um, funded and subsidised program um, because they do military service there as well. And they, mm. they noticed that it was such an effective tre uh, treatment for PTSD. So anyway, I'm back in the medicinal cannabis world. Um, I took my CBD before coming on air um, this morning. It's probably why I was like not as ruffled as well going, okay, the universe <laughs> is just. <laughs> oh, so tell me, um, tell me what, what, are, what, are the, what are the main <laughs> things? Like when you're pitching, what's it good for? What are the, for you? Like let's, I guess, put aside for the moment the illnesses what are some of the things that somebody healthy might go, oh, I might give this a try? Um, I think the things that I think about, you know, that it's non-toxic, um, non-psychotropic, um, that it's non-addictive, um, that we have, you know, um, uh, that the um, CBD or properties of CBD and THC, which is the one that can can get you high, mm -hmm. um, they work on receptors in our body, um, in, the, in what's called the endocannabinoid system. So I think like you, before you approached your meditation course, you thought, you know, you dived into the science and that's exactly what I did with this. I was like, oh, there's an incredible science here. Mm. Um, and, you know, just things um, like know, knowing that, you know, CBD can modulate how our brain cells um, control neurotransmitters. They can actually... Uh, work their magic on um, cannabinoid receptors um, and can activate serotonin. They can do all these incredible things. Um, so it can help us, our know, brain use serotonin more effectively. Um, and I just didn't know that it had such an impact on the immune system. Um, so around inflammation and, you know, um, anything that's any kind of receptor that's in our brain is where it works. Um, so that's why it can calm us down. It can help mood and, you know, that type of thing. So um, it was only after visiting Israel and interviewing all the scientists there um, and then marrying up that with the agronomy and seeing that they, we can actually breed plants with, you know, that have a specific percentage of CBD, which is called, um, it's, it's short for cannabidiol as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just, um, I was endlessly fascinated by what I was seeing on the road, um, which felt quite different to what I had read about previously. So I felt like I was actually living through this, you know, strange and alarming stigma that maybe wasn't, the, you know, uh, being represented truthfully. So I actually just felt like, oh, my gosh, this is a huge story. Um, this could change the way that we see health management as well. And, you know, um, it might, you know, it might change a lot of different treatment options for different conditions because, really what I think is the biggest story behind all of this is that we're not being, I guess it hasn't been made available, the knowledge um, hasn't been made available to the general public that it can actually be an effective, safe and reliable medical medical treatment. Mm. Um, it used to be a medical treatment back in the 30s when it was sold over the counter. Um, so it's, you know, this is something that ended up being demonised through um, 
propaganda campaigns that, um, that linked it to schizophrenia and so on. Um, and it's also important, I guess, to understand that medicinal cannabis um, is taken in much smaller doses. We're not talking about somebody smoking a bong. We're, we're talking about something quite, there's a really, you know, careful distinction to make. Um, yeah. So, of course, if you smoke, you know, huge amounts of dope that have got high levels of THC between the ages of 18 and 25 and you're a young male, well, you know, um, and even a female, uh, but particularly for young males, that absolutely can lead to, you know, um, disorders like schizoaffective disorders and, you know, um, and similar type conditions. Um, but when we talk about medicinal cannabis, I think we're talking about something else. Um, we're talking about something that's self titrated which means that we get to decide the dose, um, you know, that responds well enough to our body. And it may not be the panacea for everything, but it can work. CBD, um, the evidence has shown um, that it can work on almost every human disease state. So it's wow. cool to take. And is it, is it, are we also using the THC, the, the, the part of the cannabis that does create a high? Are we using that in medicinal cannabis or are we using the... It depends on what you get. So if you get like a CBD only blend, there'll be maybe there'll be a small trace of THC, but not much. But CBD only can actually have the THC taken out. Um, so no, um, but um, there are blends, oil blends, for instance, that, are, that contain... Um, amounts of CBD so it's about again knowing the dosage um, yeah. so it could be a couple of drops um, and that might like I had um, a CBD THC blend the other night when I was having some issues with my sleep mm. um, and you know it was just it just had a really calming effect it made me feel high enough to you know actually I felt like it gave me a couple of nights of good sleep so yeah um, THC, the most important thing to remember is that works along pain neural receptors. So that really works with chronic pain. So you will see um, THC present in medicinal cannabis, absolutely. But more often than not, it will be done through a vaporizer um, or this or an oil blend. Um, and that's how we're seeing a lot of pharmacies dis dispense. Mm, you might have to give Harps a nudge. He was, we just did a podcast yesterday where he was, he's really concerned about his father is in chronic pain at the moment um, with osteoarthritis, I believe. So maybe, maybe this is an avenue. Uh, I'll definitely contact us because, yeah, that's, I, I think, again, while it may not have an, you know, maybe it won't have an impact, but isn't it good to be able to know and have the, you know, the choice um, yeah. around our health care and not be um, reliant on something like an opioid? Um, well, so, yeah. So absolutely, um, there will be something there. And it's easier than you think as well. So you can virtually hop online and, you know, then once you make, um, you know, there's a number of websites that you can hop on and look up medicinal cannabis. Um, the company I work for is called Canatrek. That's one of them. There's another one called Green Care, who's a competitor. There's loads of them. They're, they're How do you spell so, the one that yours, what's yours called? Um, mine's called Canatrek, which is C-A-N-N-A-T-R-E-K. So if you just hop online, um, look at the telehealth, um, you know, go straight to a telehealth um, appointment um, and then speak to a doctor um, and then they'll give you a proper consultation. Um, you can do it online. There's, there's also authorised prescribers. You can find out who they are and go and see them in person. Uh, and they're on the, all on the Therapeutic Goods Administration website. So I think we have 715 authorised prescribers um, in uh, Australia at the moment. There might even be more. Um, there's probably more on the way. Wow. Uh, but in Melbourne, we have the very first authorised prescriber as well. So I can't remember her name. First name is Vicky, but it's a complicated Greek name, which I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you I'm not great at pronouncing names, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> Um, isn't that great though, but isn't it frustrating how, how long things can take to go through the system, you know, like. Absolutely. It is. Pharmaceutical yeah. drugs can come out left, right and center, but you take something that's got a bit of stigma around it. You, you clear it of all of the stuff that gets people high and you go, this is medicinal, this can work. And it's just demonized and no one can access it. And it's, I think there's that there's a period of time where people go through a lot of stress because you've got people that are terminally ill looking for answers and can't quite access something that, that maybe could, could be the difference or if not anything from help them with some quality of life.
Oh, absolutely. And I think that's what the thing that always enraged me about the whole debate because I was like, damn, you know, if I knew this when my mum was dying and how much pain she was in and how she didn't respond to, you know, certain um, opioids, I just, you know, it just kills me even now thinking, oh, we could have, you know, she could have had a more dignified end. Um, yeah. But maybe it would have helped some things. Maybe it would have helped treat some some of the symptoms or conditions that were part of her cancer. Um, so, I, you know, and I just think it's unfair. Um, I think it's unfair that people are still having to this day fight through the stigma when and for something that's been around for thousands of years. Uh, and, you know, make no mistake, we'll still, we've still got a road, a, a way to go. Um, but I do believe that it, eventually it will be accepted as a mainstream medicine. It most definitely has been around the world. Um, you know, it's legal in many, you know, over, you know, over 30 countries around the world. So um, it's, you know, something I think that we will walk through, but I think we'll need a lot of, you know, more evidence-based clinical trials, you know, around around the country. Mm. But I still think that that shouldn't stop us from being able to at least try something, um, you know, that has the potential to, to be, all, you know, life-changing, which I've mm. seen it have. Um, I've seen um, that impact firsthand, not just once or twice, but I've seen it in groups of people and just been amazed. Um, and I think, yeah, I, yeah, I think to your point, you know, it is about, um, you know, being able to work, not just work through um, that stigma, but um, I don't know, I think the frustra frustrating thing for me about this whole um, debate is that we're still denying people. And what's happening in the meantime is that we've got a market that's legalised. I think 10% of our market's legalised and 90% of it's the black market. So people are having to source it by, you know, illegal means because maybe yeah. it's too expensive as well because it is expensive. So we yeah. do need the government to come in and help subsidise um, compassionate access schemes. And we also need to be able to ad advertise, the, uh, you know, or have a public health awareness campaign or public messaging around it. But we don't because guess what? They say the TGA go, well, it's like an opioid. We're not going to promote them as well. But, oh, hang on, but they've been around for how many you know how many years now um and we know what they are we're, we're well aware of what you know what they do um but mm. medicinal cannabis doesn't get to have that kind of educated campaign around it which i think is really unfair mm. and that in essence is actually one of the reasons i've um i've joined um, an organization because i want to have some to positively influence the education awareness and um, campaigns around it. Um, and hopefully one day they'll be able to be reasonably public. But at the moment, there's so many regulations around it. It's crazy. You can virtually say nothing. So yeah, you can't wow. put case studies up on your website, nothing like that. <sighs> so frustrating. Well, I'm going to have a link to that company in the show notes. Do you have any other socials or anything that people can follow to get around you? Oh, yeah, I'm just trying to, um, yeah, maybe Instagram, but I'm, I'm thinking I'll probably put more on LinkedIn. So please, you know, come and find me on LinkedIn as well. Um, Facebook, I do have some stuff on there as well, but I don't use it that much. I'm more of a, yeah, more Instagram and LinkedIn, I guess. So, um, and also, yeah, even following the um, some of the companies um, as well, our companies, Canatrek, and there's another one, yeah, that I mentioned before called Green Care, Levin Health. They're also a Victorian company. Um, so there's a couple of, just hop on a couple of websites and have a look and um, and see because it, there'll be limited educative pathways. Mm. But essentially, um, uh, yeah, what I'm actually doing at the moment is working on getting funding for a second documentary. So this time I'm actually going to look for funding, <laughs> um, public funding. Um, get so, around it, everyone. Yeah, get around yeah. it. Because <laughs> I'm still paying off the, the last one. <laughs> um, but, look, it's been, um, and it's, and that was so worth it. But, um, but the reasons I want to do a second documentary is, is precisely for what we're talking about to say how crazy is this we've got this huge growth industry here which is you know Australians producing their own thing and guess what we produce some of the highest quality medicinal cannabis oil in the world because we have really high GMP standards mm -hmm. um, and so we're known as a, a quality producer um, but we don't we shouldn't have to rely on imports either we should actually be building it and be getting you know some help for an industry that can actually be a game changer. Yeah. So I think there's a bit of a way to go in terms of how companies are supported with their federal, you know, with infrastructure um, and being able to own their whole um, supply chain, 
Um, they're all the things that we, you know, powered by green energy. It's an amazing industry, really, um, when you look at it. So uh, I think it should be supported to do so much. I love it. Well, we'll we will check you out. We might even chat again. We might go down. If people, have, if people have questions about the CBD and everything, hit me up because we might go deeper on it. Um, I have to go for now because I've got another Zoom room waiting for me for another podcast. Otherwise, I'd probably talk to you for another half or on it all. <laughs> um, awesome. It's been a Thanks pleasure, so Helen. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed today's chat. Appreciate oh, it. So have I. Thank you very, very much. And I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties at the, at the beginning. But... <laughs> we love it. We love it. Us transcendental <laughs> meditators, we don't get exactly. phased. Oh, as a CBD on this side and transcendental <laughs> meditation. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Helen. Combo. All right. You have a beautiful week. You and too. And thanks a million.